Welcome everybody to the, uh, to the Learn and Grow series once again. My name is Vinky Lomba. I'm your host. And today I have a very, very special guest, my very good friend, Jerome Myers. We know each other for a while and um, we did a few series like this before and I'm super excited to have him back with us again. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit background on Jerome. Jerome is an award-winning engineer, investor, and business strategist renowned for guiding founders through the exit paradox. As a former corporate leader, he, he masterfully built 20 million division from the ground up with the Fortune 550 company. Today, Jerome leveraged his expertise in project management, engineering, and business to counsel leaders across diverse sectors, including real estate, financial services, business services, and healthcare. A multifaceted entrepreneur, he's a general partner in multifamily real estate portfolio and actively contributes to the North Carolina Agriculture and Technical State University Entrepreneurship Advisory Board. Jerome's accolades include the prestigious Alumni Achievements Award and recognition in top tier media outlets, showcasing his commitment to empowering entrepreneurs through his Dream Catchers podcast and coaching programs. Welcome again, Jerome. I'm super excited to have you with us today. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you guys. So this is it's different. It's a good turnout today, which is exciting. Lunch time is kind of like you don't know who's going to come. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get a hundred. And so I'm really grateful for everybody taking a little bit of time out of their day and just to listen in with me. So I really prefer to be interactive. And so the first question that I have for you, and I'm going to be asking you questions along the way, but first question I have for you, the people that are on, if you would humor me, how many of you have exited? Like how many of you have bought something, went full cycle and got out of it? Just put a one in the chat if you have. Put a one, okay. Well, I saw one person raise a hand, but if you put a one in the chat, it will really help me. <clears throat> okay. So we got two out of like 20. Um, so of were you the GP on your deal? Or were you a passive investor on the deal is the other question I have. Okay. Okay. So this is something that nobody talks about on social media. And whether it's your real estate business, some other business that you build, everybody ends up in the same experience. And it's something that we've found out and something that I've went through. And so the deck that I'm going to be running through today is going to talk about this problem that everybody experiences, especially if they're on the GP side. Um, and so let me run through what we've identified as a founder exit paradox. And then from there, we can jump into Q&A because I think it is something that is extremely um, people get caught blindsided by it and it puts them in a bad spot. And it's funny because even though I knew about it, I went through this experience again um and so vinky do you see my background stuff or do you see the big slide presentation uh just the slide presentation okay great because sometimes zoom will share something that i don't want to share okay great so hey we're going to talk about navigating the founders exit paradox and multifamily real estate and there's a couple of different things that happen as you go through the deal so as Can an you agenda. Go, sorry to interrupt you. Can you go full screen because it's uh, kind of slide mode? Uh, swipe displays. Yeah. Is it slide mode now? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. That was a question I was trying to get the answer to. Okay. So we're going to talk about me. Uh, we're going to talk about the illusion that nobody posts on social media. And then we're going to run through a case study where I break down how this works. We're going to talk about my big mistakes. Because I hate when people get on these things and pretend like they do everything perfectly. I make so many mistakes. I don't actually know how I'm successful, but um, I think my willingness to be able to make mistakes is part of the reason why we've been able to accomplish some of the things that we've accomplished. Um, I'm going to offer you guys some free resources so that if you don't need them right now, in the future, you will have that stuff in your bag. And then we'll do Q&A and wrap it up. So about me, Vinky read a really long bio. I don't know where it came from. And that's great. 
But here is what was happening. Back in 2016, I was operating in my own little world. I just built a $20 million division for a Fortune 550 company. Literally, I was employee number two. We had zero dollars in revenue. By September, I had 175 people on my team. End of the year, $20 million in profit, or I'm sorry, $6 million in profit, $20 million in revenue. We laid people off that year and I got a really bad taste in my mouth. I said, I'll never do that again. We went on another run the next year, another 30% uh, profit margin or $6 million in profit, another $20 million in revenue. But I said, I didn't want to be in corporate anymore because I didn't have control. So I dropped out and then I went and started being on the doors of banks and said, hey, don't you want to give me a million dollars so I can buy my first apartment building? They all told me no, all 10 of them. And I felt like a complete and total failure because in college, I decided I want to be a multifamily investor, but I didn't know anybody how to do it. I'm the son of a soldier and a stay at home mom. Nobody with a multimillion dollar real estate portfolio was coming over to the cookout for us. And so when the banks turned me down, I decided to enroll in YouTube University. Anybody else enrolled in you? Anybody got a degree from YouTube University? Because uh, I got mine. Right. I enrolled in YouTube University. I started uh, listening to about 40 hours a week of podcasts and got into fix and flipping because if they could do it on HGTV, then obviously I would be able to fix and flip houses. And so started doing that. And then I got invited to invest in my first deal about a year later. Um, it was a deal that I was trying to get those banks to lend me money on, but they told me I didn't have any experience, so I wasn't qualified. In that deal, I got the experience box check. So now I was lendable. I was bankable. And in addition to that, I actually served in the role as asset manager on my first deal. And we sold that deal last year. Um, and the, during this presentation, in the case study, we'll talk about the deal that a deal that we sold this year. And then in 2020 ish, we started teaching people how to invest in multifamily using our four-step system to find, fund, flicks, and flip multifamily deals. And we, we still offer that for folks who are interested in a self-paced course, but we don't talk about it very often anymore. Um, and just to kind of lend a credibility, I've raised over a million dollars and we've been through multiple repositions. Um, last year, the first deal that we bought, the one we bought in 2017, we were able to exit it. Um, I think we paid 1.3 for it. We exited it for 3.6 or 3.7. Um, that was a 23 unit building in Richmond, Virginia, where we tuck rents from 695 on average to about 1295. Just to give you an understanding of what we've done. I know there's a bunch of people who talk about the thousands of doors they own. There's a bunch of people who talk about the multi hundred unit properties that they buy. Um, our focus has always been on workforce housing because we believe on a percentage basis for the capital that we invest, we're able to get a bigger return. And so if you want me to wow you with asset center management, I'm not that guy. Um, I think the educators have confused a lot of us. Um, they show us the cash flow quadrant. They tell us if we're employees that we need to be investors. And so many of us go and take our money and, and try to become investors. And you can do that as an LP. You can do that with your 401k. You can do that with investing in the Roth. Like you can pick whatever your vehicle is. But I think a lot of people are skipping steps. And so it's my suggestion for people who are looking to get free and people who are looking to drew, build true wealth, wealth that passes through generations that they become self-employed and they eventually become business owners. And part of that is simply because of the tax benefits. As your income grows, your taxes become your biggest expense. But in addition to that, the ability, the levers that you have to pull in order to increase the profitability and grow what the enterprise is worth is dramatically different if you're self-employed and eventually turn that into a business. And so in my mind, with multifamily real estate, your ability to be in the GP makes you a business owner. And when I say, what's the difference between self-employed and a business owner? Because that question comes up a lot. So let me get that one. So a business owner has a manager in place or a chief operating officer in place. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day of running the business. The goal is to manage the manager. And so you buy a property, your property manager manages your property. Um, if you buy the bigger buildings, they have pretty good on-site management. Um, if you're buying smaller things like we've done, 
you usually don't have somebody on site. And so your third party property manager has to be really, really good. Um, the other thing I will say is a lot of people are trying to get free, but they're not actually doing the math. If you invest $50,000 in something passively and they offer you an 8% return, you're going to make $4,000 a year. If you bought something that doesn't appreciate and you keep it for five years, I think that's 20 grand on your 50,000. If you take that and invest in education for yourself or invest it in a business, I think you can make a much, much bigger return on that. And so I'll just leave that there for folks to ponder on and think through as they're going through this. And I bring that part up because it's like get free, retire. And let's look at the math. So the, the graph on the right, it shows what the average amount of money somebody has saved for re- the people in America have saved for retirement. So the average is 84 grand. Now, most people will know that they can't retire on that. Then there's about 25% of the people who have over $200,000 saved. I know everybody here is a whole lot wealthier than that. And so maybe they have a million dollars saved. The whole point is this. If you're investing 80,000, you get an 8% return. That's $6,400 a year. It's not going to do much for you. If you invest 800,000 and you get an 8% return, you get 64,000. Some people may be able to live off that, but as inflation happens, so on and so forth, people might get uncomfortable with that. But if you got $8 million invested, that's when the numbers get really, 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 really attractive and people get to a place where they're not spending any of the principal. And so I don't know what your number is, but figuring out what your number is, is really important from my perspective, because when you know what that number is, then you know how to invest. My belief is that when you do these deals, you buy something that appreciates. And in addition to that, you've got to have something, and this is why this slide is so important, that's creating cash that you can put somewhere else. And a lot of times that number, like the bigger the number that you earn is capped when you have a job. And so what is your cash machine so that you have the capital so that you can deploy it in a big enough number so that you can actually generate the cash flow that you want to generate? It's great to invest something off stock market because you get tax benefits and so on and so forth, but really make sure that you've got a solid plan and you're not just putting money somewhere and hoping that something good happens because I see a lot of people do that. And I see a lot of syndicators market their deals in a way where people think something really special is going to happen. And it's so much superior to the stock market. And then when people actually look at their returns, they're questioning why they actually did it. Um, So This kind of brings everything full together for me. So I believe there's eight exits of a founder. And so we talked about the cash flow quadrant where you're an employee. So exit one is leaving from being an employee. A lot of people say I got the golden handcuffs on. I said that a bunch of times. And then I actually figured out that, no, they were not gold at all. And I make a whole lot more money not working for somebody else. But in the beginning, what you end up doing is trading your nine to five for five to nine. and so. I never, I will never forget driving into the city to one of my fix and flip houses because that became, that was me becoming self-employed and saying, I'm working so much harder than I did when I had a job. And I just don't understand why I traded that for this. When you get to the next level, which is exit two, no longer being the chief everything officer. I know people like to throw the CEO title around. chief everything officer, you have some people in place that are making things happen. So you're not responsible for doing everything. You, you, maybe you've got a superintendent, maybe you've got a property manager, pick your poison, but people are doing things in order to make sure that the property, the business is working as you desire. And I, I think that's a point that a lot of us skip. Like when you're buying a multifamily, it's set up to be a business. It's not real estate. You're not buying real estate. You're buying a business. There's a P&L. There's um, projections on what you're going to make. There's budgets. And a lot of people kind of simplify this. Oh, I'm just buying a piece of real estate. No, you're buying a business. And so these skills apply regardless of what asset class or what business or industry that you're buying. Um, exit three is becoming the true CEO. And so this is where you put somebody in place to actually handle the day-to-day operations. And this is the one that gets super exciting for people because they get their life back. 
they get their life back. Somebody else has the burden of making sure that the business works. But in addition to that person being in place, you've got to have systems and processes. And so the CEO then can think strategically. They can look at new opportunities um, and then they can check in on the things that they feel are important, sales, um, finance, et cetera. Um, from there, you want to fire yourself as CEO and become an owner. And that means you, you don't have any day-to-day responsibilities. You're just totally free. And so there's money coming to you, but you don't have to show up in order for that money to show up. And I think that's what most people are seeking. I think that's what most people are searching for. And they feel like they've got to do it in a very complicated way. But if you make it through one through four in a business that you own, whether it's real estate or something else, right? Because there's a lot of real estate entrepreneurs, then you can actually achieve that freedom. And I don't think anybody ever really talks about that piece. And so then like you can go bigger. So if you are familiar with Grant Cardone, he talks about how he's building this portfolio so he can sell it to BlackRock, right? Well, in order for a lot of that stuff to happen, he's going to have to put a board in place and that board is going to make decisions. He might be the chairman of the board, but he's going to need a board in place so that they can do what he has a vision for doing. And I don't think he's actually gotten to that place yet. And then when he sells that big portfolio to one of the hedge funds, he'll get a huge exit, a big old pot of gold. And this is when founders ask the question, what's now? They spent five, 10, 20, 25 years building a thing and they wrapped their identity up in it because it's been all consuming. And now it's gone. It's gone and they're asking questions. Most of them on the backside of that start investing, right? They build a portfolio. They build a portfolio of different assets and the businesses become the things that they buy and sell instead of the product of the business. And so if we related to multifamily, what we're selling is time, the availability to use our unit. When we get to the place where we have a portfolio of properties like Vinky does, right? Now we're buying and selling the properties within the portfolio. And this is where you get massive excess, especially if you can bring them together and put together a portfolio and get a larger multiple because your net operating income is so much bigger than what you would have if you did onesie twosie properties. And then once you do that, I think most people end up doing something and it's kind of rare, but when they get the exit eight, they do something that is philanthropic. And so the pinnacle of this is somebody endowing a foundation and the endowment allows the foundation to run without them having to go out and raise funds in order for that nonprofit, not-for-profit, or even business enterprise to fulfill their mission. And so, you know, this is something that we've come up with, we think is really helpful for the trajectory of people, because you can literally think about where you are on this journey. And the wealth that you have is so much greater at the bottom when you compare it to the top the tax benefits are so much greater at the bottom and when you compare it to the top. And so it's just like, where am I? What's my next step? And I just think it's a really, really helpful um, roadmap for people who are on this journey trying to figure out how to get free. All right. So I assume you're here because you're investing off Wall Street or you desire to invest off Wall Street. Is that fair? Like, is, is there anybody here because of something else? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I'm going to assume that everybody agrees with that. All right. So you're investing off Wall Street. Great. What are you going to do when you actually get free? Do you know? Do you have a plan? Do you have any idea when you don't have to work for money, what are you going to do with your time? Like, this is a real question. You could come off mute and tell me the answer. Help others make a difference. I think it's different for everybody. Yeah, but so Vinky, I'm glad you came off mute first because this is good because I think you're probably really far along in this. So what does help others mean? Like, what what do you, how do you, who do you want to help and what problem do you want to help them with? For me, I just want it to be a resource to multiple people in multiple ways. 
whether it's being philanthropic, because I do have a nonprofit too that I support in multiple ways. And other than that, I do help people with the financial freedom or anything else. I even help people with the IT needs, you know, because I have a divorce background Go myself. Back. So yeah. yeah, it's like my way of giving back. It's just like I took so much from the society for over the course of time and did everything mm-hmm. for only me and my family. So this is my time to add value to others. So okay. I think that's the key thing for me, but it could be different for anybody, you know, or everybody. Yeah, is different. I, I think, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but I think in general, people end up in the same place. They may try a bunch of different things, but I think we figured out kind of the shortcut. So here's the thing for me. And like, I literally went through this this summer. Um, you get the deal. Everybody posts about closing. Then they post about exiting the deal or exiting the portfolio. But nobody talks about the feelings that happen on the backside of it. So you've got a portfolio. Let's say you've got three properties in your portfolio. You sell one and you pride yourself on being the person that had X amount of millions of dollars of assets under management. Now you don't. You prided yourself on, this is the number of doors I have. Now you don't. The property's gone. So a piece of that bravado, specifically for the people who are stuck on how big the number is, is gone. You start asking a bunch of questions. But first, you're like, man, I've got more money in my bank account than I've ever had. The wire hit. You saw the check. I've got more money in my bank account than I've ever seen. It feels really good. And then something called the founder's exit paradox takes over. Like it's the founder's exit paradox is when you go through the process of parting ways with something that you created. And so for me, we've always done heavy value add projects. And so we'll take something that's really dumpy. That first property that we sold, there was drugs, there was prostitutes, there were bed bugs, like the sewers were broken. Like we, we, did everything to make that a new property. And it's a point of pride. You drive by, it's like, yeah, I own that. Or, you know, me and my partners own that or however you want to describe it. But now it's not yours anymore. And like the questions start to come in you start doubting yourself. You're like, well, can I do another deal? Or was I just lucky? Do I have the am i as important or as popular now that i don't have that deal anymore because people don't really call you at least for me i don't have once my exit a deal like the other people that partner with me we don't have a whole lot to talk about like we we talk about the property operations and then we move on so there's six centers of doubt, self-image, which I've won the game. Who am I now? Right. We got the check. We got the big check. We won. Woohoo. Um, our ROI was whatever. Or our IRR was whatever. People love to brag about that. Um, but then there's the relationships and you're questioning like, well, are, is this person my friend or is the, are they a deal friend or like, who are they and what are they about? Do I even like them? I'll never forget one guy in that deal said, yeah, we don't want those people living there. I was like, those people are paying us money. Why wouldn't we want them to live there? Um, the work. Um, so I don't ever, I don't have to spend time on that anymore. What do I do now? And this is the hole that a lot of people try to fill with going backpacking or buying cars or buying watches or uh, th- there's some hedonistic tendencies that many of us have when we feel that. And th- those things don't last very long. Uh, I don't know about anybody else here, but I've stressed about properties. There have been deals that weren't cash flowing and I had to reach in my pocket and pay mortgages at times. Um, that was struggle. Um, that led me to eating a bunch of stuff I shouldn't be eating and gaining weight and not sleeping well. Like there was a whole lot of my well being that was affected by doing some of the deals that I've done. The prosperity. This is a, one that is kind of an oxymoron. It's like, oh, I got more money than I've ever had. But I don't know if I want to spend it. And so for the people who are trying to get to a specific number, hey, if you got eight million and you spend one dollar, now you no longer have eight million. Right. If you got a million dollars and you spend one dollar, you're no longer a millionaire. <laughs> and I know for a lot of people, it's like, oh, I got this status. But 
I don't know what it actually means. And so people have a hard time, especially if they live frugally, right? The fire folks, they have uh, financial independence, retire early. They cut their lifestyle way back and they don't spend money on anything that they don't absolutely have to. And so it's like, oh, I'm saving all this money so I can get free. And then once you build that muscle of discipline, once you build that muscle of um, deferring your your um, indulgement, I think people then can get in a unhealthy space when it comes to this way that they interact with the funds that are left in their care. And this significance, this is the one that always gets me because I often ask, does my life really matter? Um, I'll never forget going to a funeral and realizing I didn't know who would carry my casket if I died. And so why is that important? Well, it's kind of important for me because the money is great, but who cares? And then we go to the place of, did I actually make a difference with the things that I was doing from a business perspective? Or do I need to go do those things philanthropically? Because my goal is to make it so that it is a big deal when I'm no longer here. Um, you know, it's just a big deal because of how many people were impacted. And so let's run down a case study of me and what I went through this summer. So we bought a deal in July of 2018. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, COVID hit in uh, March of 23. Uh, we worked on doing a refinance a tip in May of 23. And the valuation was like 1.375 because that's what we needed to get an agency loan. Um, we weren't able to get the refinance because our um, trailing financials wouldn't support a loan that big with the debt service coverage ratio that they required. And so that fall, we decided to list it for sale. And the broker came to me. He was like, hey, man, I can I'll list it for one point six. I said, hey, it was a 20 unit building. So it was eighty dollars, eighty thousand dollars. And I said, look, don't give me a big number saying that you can get this because I'm not going to drop the price when we go under contract. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I said, I don't want you to spend money on marketing and do all this stuff because you want somebody to bring me an offer for 1.4 or 1.45 or 1.5. And so somebody brought us an offer for 1.5. And I said, no. And he was confused. And I was like, dude, I told you like list price, the close price for me is really important. And so we didn't sell the deal. We continue to go on. Um, 2022 rolled around and we got an unsolicited offer. I think it was for 1.4. And they were like, yeah, you know, we're coming out of COVID. And this property actually did fairly well after we got all the relief dollars during COVID. And I was like, yeah, I talked to my partners in the deal. They were like, do what you think is best. And so we didn't take the 1.4. And so then in the spring of this year, I think it was in February, we got an LOI unsolicited from a group. Um, it took us about a month to get through the contract. And then very shortly after that, we closed. And so that was a property that we bought for $840,000. Um, we sold it for $1.73 million. And when it was all said and done, we got a check. And so... Me and my partners got the opportunity to split up 1.1 million after putting $250,000 in a property in about five years. And for some people, that's a small check. For us, it was a big check. It felt really good because we didn't have 85 people in it. Like it was four, right? And so when you're able to quadruple the money that people put in in less than five years, it feels really good for us. But I went into a place because I was asset manager. I found the deal. I sold the deal. Like, and I was responsible for meeting with the property manager. So for me, I, I got the check, which was cool. I, if, if you can get a check instead of a wire, always get the check because you want to be able to take pictures and hold it. But what did it really mean? Did it mean that I was smart or did we just happen to time the market right? Did it mean that we actually executed our business plan and we successfully exited? We actually beat the projections on the business plan. But does that actually mean that we did it or was it something else? And so all of the doubt started to creep in and you've got the money, right? So now what? 
we maximized the valuation. It was more than the refinance, which we plan on doing a refinance. It was more than the first unsolicited offer. It was more than the second. We maximized the valuation. So did we get everything that we could out of it? Did we actually impact the lives of the people that lived there? Did we make the community better? Those are the questions that I was asking on the backside of getting the check on the long drive from the closing office to the bank. And then it got worse because I couldn't talk to anybody about how I was feeling because my partners were happy. They got their money and they were like, oh man, this is amazing. Like you three X what we put in or you four X or whatever the number was. But it, it wasn't perfect for me. Like it, I, I was struggling and I'll be honest, I wasn't happy. Um, but it, for all intents and purposes, I felt like I should be. And so this is the, why we call it a paradox, because it's like this really great thing happened, but now you're questioning a bunch of other things and the nostalgic feelings fade so fast and you end up in a space of like, what's next? So can I spend the money? Can I, should I buy a new property? It, like all of these questions were seeping in. And in the end, I knew something wasn't right. And I, I spent a bunch of time in doubt. And so these are some of the questions that you'll ask on the exit. And it doesn't matter which exit you go through as a founder, whether it's leaving corporate America. I don't care if you retire, you're going to go through this exact same thing. Questioning who am I now? Questioning why other people are further along than you are. From the relationship standpoint, do you still want to be involved with the same people? Does what happened change anything? Some people get divorces on the backside of windfalls like that. Some people um, decide they're not going to talk to their parents because they don't care about the inheritance anymore. There's so many things that happen. Um, from a work, do I take a break? Which is something I did. I took most of the summer off. Um, do I want to continue investing in this asset class? Like that is a question I've been asking myself over and over again. Um, the deal fatigue. So it's up, it's down. The deal's happening. The deal's not happening. The deal's happening. We got earnest money. Oh, they're changing the terms of the contract. Like that in and of itself is enough to drive a sober person like me to drink. It's stressful. It's taxing. Something always comes up. You're worried that a unit at the property will catch on fire or there'll be a murder or all these things that are totally outside of your control. But you know, if they happen, they'll negatively impact the deal, potentially kill the deal. And so, hey, yeah, we did the calculations. We pulled out the spreadsheet. We think we're going to get a million dollars. But one of those things happen and the person retrades or ends the negotiations. From the prosperity standpoint, can I spend any of the money? Or do I have to reinvest it all? I spent money, but such is, such is the case for me. I'm going to enjoy it. Um, am I lazy if I take a break? You got this time, right? So if you get the income, you don't have to trade the time for money now. Or am I lazy now? Because, you know, I'm a grinder. I'm working from five to nine. I, I don't know. Did it actually make a difference? What was it all for from a significant standpoint? And so um, Marty Slegman is the kind of founder or father of positive psychology. And he talks about the three types of happiness. And so what most people do is they chase pleasure, right? That's the first thing they do. And so they'll buy more of the things, they'll spend the money and they'll keep doing more and more because they don't know how else to get that feeling that they're chasing. Then it's actually finding your passion. That's the next level. From then from there, it's doing something that gives you higher purpose or meaning. And so, Vinky, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you're talking about making an impact. Um, my thing is being super intentional about that so that it's not scattered and you can make a bigger dent. And so what we believe is your happiness goes up when over the course of time, when you find something that is higher purpose and meaning for you. Um, and it's usually outside of your house. I know a lot of people are parents and it's like, I just want to do this for my kids, but just keep it in the back of your mind. It's usually the greater good. Um, and to go with Marty's um, three levels of happiness, he put together this model of well-being called PERMA. And so it's the positive emotions, engagement, relationship, having meaning, 
and then some sense of accomplishment. So if you want to do the like philanthropic thing, but you don't have a way to demonstrate that you actually made progress on it, it's going to become deflating because you don't know that you're actually making progress to it. So the accomplishment piece is super important. (laughs) So what we did was we wanted to build on PERMA because I don't feel like it is comprehensive. And so we use our red pill model, which is the basis for everything for us. It's our model for a centered life. And so we went back through the six areas. And so from a self-image, standpoint it it was for me positive reframing like we made an impact for my partners and their families and they're going to go off and do one thing like one guy wrote the biggest tithe check that he's ever written as a result of the proceeds that he got from investing in the deal um forgiving myself for the mistakes that i made and continuing to celebrate the wins because i mean there was one thing like when i underwrote the deal i wrote the taxes as a thousand dollars a year instead of ten thousand and that impacted valuation and it impacted the model. And it's like, how could I miss it? How could the partners miss it? How could the bank miss it? Everybody just kind of overlooked it. And at the end of the day, um, it impacted how much money we made. Uh, we have something called a 2C matrix where we look at people's contribution and their capacity as it impacts our lives. Um, I think as Apex performers, a lot of people have folks in their lives who are draining them. And they don't have a bunch of mutually beneficial relationships. And so I use that tool to make sure that I have the right people in my life um, seeking social support. There were a few folks that I reached out to that I know had been through similar instances. And I knew that I could openly talk to them about what I was going through. But in the beginning, I felt shame. I felt like it was something I shouldn't be feeling. And so I didn't want to open up about that. Um, From a work standpoint, started getting engaged in other ventures. Um, started exploring new asset classes. And we've actually spent a lot of time looking at operating businesses that aren't tied to real estate because we feel like we can make a bigger impact and grow the valuation of those so that we have more equity to deploy into um, real estate projects in the future. Um, Got rid of 20 pounds, um, reduced my resting heartbeat, uh, prosperity, took time off. My dad asked me what I was going to do when I sent him the check. And I said, think. And I spent a whole lot of time thinking. And part of that was this presentation. Um, We increased our wealth, um, figured out some important things from a tax planning perspective, made charitable donation and did discounted public speaking. And so those were the things that I did in order to help me move through this. Um, And I think there are things that you could probably use to when you get to that point. Um, Maximizing the value of the business is great. But you want to make sure that you're maximizing you. There's going to be a whole person on the backside of your exit. And again, people are not going to talk to you about this. But anybody who was the asset manager for a big deal and they found it, they put the deal together, they figured out how to get out of it and they made money for people. And because I'm talking about the positive side of this, there's always a there's also a negative side when people make a mistake. But they're licking their wounds because they made a mistake. When the things went as they were supposed to go, um, there's going to be a person on the backside of that that is questioning and struggling a little bit. And there's not a mental health diagnosis for it. There's not um, most psychologists or counselors or therapists aren't going to understand it. And it's something that I'm really passionate about talking about. So we can move into Q&A. What I wanted to say is we we interview founders who have exited on a Dreamcatchers podcast. We've got everything from multifamily investors to people who've built staffing companies for nurses that uh, serve the VA. And I, it's really interesting. And we go through the eight exits so that people can see what is on course for them as they continue to grow. Um, and then the other thing is we created a white paper and we called it the five mistakes every founder should avoid when they're exiting their company. And you can get that at exitparadox.com. And so I would appreciate it if you don't listen to the podcast, you subscribe, grab the white paper. And then if we're not connected on LinkedIn, then 
I would love to be connected with you. And we can go through the Q&A now if you guys want. And I was thinking about leaving this up, but maybe I should just go to stop the screen share and let folks. Um, I'll drop the link in the chat so you can get the white paper. Just let people um, fire off, fire away. Anybody has any question, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I know. That's what I was going to say. So, wow, that was like really, really mind boggling and uh, just like really, really sweet insight into the back end of how things work, how mind works. So, Gene, you go first. I'll ask later on. Go ahead. With your well, question. we're coming on, on exits, uh, we project out. So, Looking ahead, uh, we've been concerned about that. What do you do in all this? Because we have a lot of high net worth individuals that we talk with, and we've seen this, but this this was very well laid out, Jerome. Uh, this needs Thank to you. be put out there more. There's, what, 10,000 exits a month that people are doing, selling business and everything else. And it's a, it's a huge uncertain market out there. Um, and luck, you know, I put in there the fear of success and everything else. I've seen people come up to that closing and absolutely blow opportunity of a lifetime literally and you know watch and turn to alcoholism after it's like well you, you were there what happened so uh, yeah. i'm very very timely in my life to, to hear you pop on the uh rico once again uh, thanks for putting this out there appreciate it gene thanks for that feedback it, it's it's really meaningful for me because like there are these are really talented people who don't have a place. It's kind of like a nuclear power plant. I was in the power industry before I started this real estate stuff. Right. And so at, it, with the nuclear reactor, if it doesn't have a place to put the energy, then it eats itself and then it explodes. And so what, what you, we're talking about right now is collateral damage. So this person doesn't have a place to put the thing. The other way I've heard it described, and it's probably one that I think everybody can relate to. So if a dog doesn't get exercise, they will go dig holes. They will dig holes in a flower bed and they'll put things in those holes. And that's literally what we do is we'll create a problem for us to solve. And it negatively impacts so many people if we're not careful. So we got super talented people who are um, negatively being impacted and they don't even, they're getting blindsided. The majority of founders have no idea. It's like, I've got more money than I ever thought I would have. How can I possibly have any problems? Because so many of us think all of our problems are related to money. So many of us are chasing the F of financial freedom. And I don't think that's the game. I think it's impact. And somebody wrote Ikigai. Yeah. And so like the five things is a, like a condensed thing. We've got a full on research paper. that's like 30 pages where we actually bring in Ikigai and talk about it. We've actually adjusted that model because we think there are some other things that are more important than what Ikigai talks about, but um, Ikigai is just a Venn diagram and it, it includes uh, what the world needs, what you're good at, what you can get paid for. And I forget what the fourth one was off the top of my head, but it's just a model for people finding meaning. I think was that you left the philanthropy aspect of it. There is something to do with the world to win that, the number four, right? Yeah. Uh, so I thought that philanthropy piece was what the world needs. I think it's what the world needs, what the world will. Yeah, I, I don't remember that. For, I think it's like, so. what do you can be paid for? What the world needs, what you're good at it or what you love? I think, I don't know. I think that's what, what was, you love is the last one. So it's what are you good at? What do you love? What the world needs and what can you get paid for? Love was the one. Yeah, that's a really good one. I think it was a really insightful session. So, I mean, it's like really, really power pack insight and wanted to ask you this question here. I mean, are you shared, first of all, just being a founder or CEO of the company and achieving the meaning of the CEO? You said chief everything officer. And this is so true because whenever you give yourself title CEO, all of a sudden you just like, I can do everything. You feel like you're invincible and then you burn out over the course of time. And the second thing uh, you mentioned was like eight steps, you know, how you can uh, walk to that journey. 
And then I love that chief exit officer. I think that needs to be incorporated as well <laughs> in the whole journey, you know. So you have eight steps, you know, in the process that you follow. And then the first one to four are really critical. So my question is, is like on the step on those process first, you know, because you get so entangled. Everybody does. It's a human nature. You get entangled. You get attached to your deal. You get attached to your title. If you're in a corporate world, you just get attached to all the shiny objects around that. Been there, done that. That's so I can speak from my experience. So it's like very hard to let go, right? And then, uh, and the thing is going from point A to point Z, it takes uh, the whole life to get there. And all of a sudden you decide, oh my God, I think that's what I was looking for all my life, the happiness by making a difference in others' life. That gives me the true happiness. So why can't we just skip all that and start from the very beginning, that from the, from the end step onwards, you know, like you're talking about your red pill. Our blue pill, I love your model of red blue, our red pill and blue pill. So why can't we start from there? You know, because we have the experience, right? We took long journey to get here. So how can people just, you know, set themselves up so they are not attached, they're detaching themselves day one, and they are not going through that pattern over and over again, the nostalgic feeling that you were talking about. Because it's always like that. When you start something, you're all pumped up. You're super happy. I'm going to do this. And boom, mm -hmm. five years down the road, it ends. Now what, right? So you're kind of in the hamster wheel. So how can you break that cycle or break that pattern? So why didn't we just go to finding fulfillment instead of chasing financial freedom? I think one is programming, right? The American dream is all about financial freedom, period. Like it's, oh yeah, you're, you're going to buy the house. You're going to raise a family. You're going to have the dogs. You're going to have the luxury cars. And then you're going to retire so that you can spend time with the grandkids because your kids are already grown. Like that is what is the ideal life. That's what people say that it's supposed to be. Um, it sounds really selfish when I say it that way, right? Because it's all about your house and what happens at your house. Um, but I, I, I implore people, I beg people to actually do the thing that's going to make a difference. Most people don't actually care about the real estate. There are very few people who care about housing and providing quality housing. For the people that care about providing quality housing, you should be a real estate investor. You should be a real estate entrepreneur. You should have the real estate professional designation. But most people don't care, care about it. And so they should go make a whole lot of money doing the other thing that they care about. And then if they want to create revenue streams by investing in these businesses, great. But I think you should invest in the thing that's going to impact the problems that you're curious and interested in. Because I think that's when you make the biggest impact. If we go back to the Ikigai stuff, right? It's what do you love? That's a passion question. What problem do you want to eradicate from the face of the earth? is my favorite question to ask somebody. For me, I'm trying to end suffering, specifically for people who others just assume that they don't have any problems. So the muscle that you were talking about earlier, you know, that you're building this muscle to make the money or get to the level where you have tons of money, but you do not know what to do with that money now. You know, you don't even want to spend because if you spend a dollar, you won't be a millionaire now, right? <laughs> so you're just holding on to that money. So shouldn't that, you know, change? Uh, you should start building a muscle in a way that changes being incorporated day one is you know, that I'm a different person, I'm making money, but I'm going to live my life too. Because in this whole chaos of life, we forget to live. And as a matter of fact, I'm writing an article. I do a Friday Gyan or Fair Friday article. Please uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And I put it on LinkedIn too. So I was writing about that, how to live in the present moment and then <laughs> how to create a life because every moment, whatever you're doing, if you're present, Whatever decision you're making is dictating your next moment and next moment and next moment. And that's how your destiny is created. But we get so caught up in the chaos called life, we forget to live. We are never present. We are just like somewhere else. Yes, physically you are here, but not necessarily you're tuned in 100%, right? To pick up all the knowledge or all the things that are happening around you to observe and absorb. So, uh, and then you're just 
making whatever decision, whatever pattern you're following in your mind accordingly. So accordingly, you're deciding your destiny yourself. So uh, please uh, tune in uh, to my Friday Gyan if you haven't already. I'm sharing that topic today and it's very um, insightful session for me today because I'm going to tweak it a little bit more to add all the things that I learned from Jerome. So Jerome, if you can talk about that, if you can uh, build up a change muscle too as we are building wealth. So we are enjoying and living at the same time. Yeah. So what happens, and I mean, you can do this beforehand, but I think what happens is the issue is amplified. Most of us don't think of ourselves as resource allocators. So the two resources that I think we have to allocate regularly if we want to make real progress is time and capital. And so when you get a big check, it's harder for you to allocate it if you're not used to allocating that amount of money, right? The time thing, everybody's got the same amount of time, but the money thing changes pretty dramatically. And so if you're not living on a budget or if you're not used to running a budget, it's going to be difficult for you to figure out how to do the thing. Then I think things should be done in general in moderation. Should I spend all of the money that I made? I should. And that's probably not financially wise because I'm back in the same spot I was before I got started. Actually, I'm behind because of time and so on and so forth. But if I don't have a rule, and you can just use percentages, right? Like if if I get $10,000, I immediately spend 10% of it on something. I, I, it doesn't matter what it is. I, I'm going to buy something because I believe that you have to get it out. You have to get the consumption piece out. And then from there, you don't feel guilty about, well, giving or um, uh, saving or however else you allocate capital that comes to you. And that was something that I, we actually created when I was still getting bonuses. It's like, when do I get these large checks? When you get a chunk of money, what happens? And then there's, okay, the day-to-day with your income. But um, I think you have to figure out how you allocate resources before you get the money in your hands, because you will not know what to do when it happens. And unfortunately, when you get that windfall, it's very much like the lottery. And so if you haven't grown into the person or have systems and processes in place to deal with the thing when it comes, then you just make a mess of it. Thank you. I think that was really good. Anybody has any question at this point, please uh, feel free to ask. I guess I have a question (laughs) or more of a statement. Um, let's say like, like in your case, you made $250,000. Now that's not necessarily life changing. I mean, it is, but like, you still have to work and get other deals for the future. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? I guess. Well, I mean, I guess it's all relative. Do you have to work this year? Probably not. Right. And so, or do you have to work this summer? Probably not. Um, How do I deal with that? I allocate the capital. So this goes to the next deal. This is what I'm going to spend. This is what I'm going to give. This is money that just kind of sits there for me to enjoy at another point. If I don't want to spend on a watch or a car or whatever hedonistic pleasure I would love. We we went on a trip. We we drove from North Carolina to um, L.A., and we stopped in Atlanta and Tuskegee, Alabama, Houston, Texas, um, San Antonio, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Vegas. And like we, we did all this really cool stuff. Right. And we, we took a helicopter from the Vegas Strip to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Kids, I hope the kids never forget it. You know what I mean? So it's just like. Allocate the resource and treat it like. My football coach always used to tell us, like, act like you've been to the been there before. And it's like you've got to actually be in a place where those resources are managed well so that more of it comes back to you. I I believe that getting begets getting, especially if you use the things that you've been given and left in your care properly. And so um, for me, it was just an allocation type thing. And but at uh, the same time, you're you're kind of thinking that maybe hmm, some additional money, like you could use the entire two fifty to put in another deal, versus like maybe I would never like, do that. No, 
I wouldn't do it because that's just not my belief. I don't believe that I get money and I don't get to enjoy any of it. I think it's important for me to enjoy the stuff that comes to me. I think you should take some off the table. I, that's what I personally believe. There's some people who's like, I'm trying to get to financial freedom as fast as I can. I, I'll get there. I don't think it's going to add an extra 10 years if I enjoy the money right now. And like, if I don't spend any of it, then maybe I don't go on that trip. Maybe we don't, maybe we just walk on the strip or maybe we take a bus that takes 12 hours to go to the Grand Canyon versus doing that round trip in four and they get to see the Hoover Dam from the sky and et cetera, et cetera, right? Maybe we don't get the suite in Vegas. Maybe we just get a regular um, bedroom or regular hotel room. Like for me, the experience is far more important than having an extra $10,000 because I didn't want to spend it from the deal because that $10,000 might net me at 8%, $800 in the next deal. You know what I mean? Like you can factor in, you can try to factor in the appreciation, but from a cash flow perspective is, it's negligible for me. And I, I agree on that 100% with Jerome. And I'm going to add to that, Jerome, if you don't mind, because what happened is, uh, let's say he made quarter million dollars, right? So if you're making that kind of money, even if it's not a substantial amount, what happened is it gives your mind some piece of mind, little piece. It creates a little bit of space in your mind. And when you're spending a little bit on yourself, going on vacation or something, you know, I mean, uh, we all live in a beautiful country, right? Everything, all the surroundings are beautiful. But wherever we live, you know, and whatever location we are, we do not even pay attention because we are so caught up in our own mind all the time, so busy. We do not see the beauty. But when you go on vacation, all of a sudden you say, oh, Switzerland, snow, oh my God, so beautiful. Because our mind is free of worries. So this money, whatever you're making, it's going to make, give you some freedom in your mind. And that will, when you create that space, you're going to figure out who you are and it's going to give you more ideas, more opportunities, how to allocate, how to make more. Yeah. So uh, As, that's not the end of it. It's like the beginning of it, like a stepping stone into something different, different paradigm. But what happens when you're, the other people that you're with do not want to go on vacation or maybe the, you know, like other people, they kind of like, ooh. You know, like you don't want to, you know, have like other people be jealous of you or something like that. Like I don't care so if other people are jealous. That is never a concern for me. Um, at the end of the day, like we've built and can we've built the life that we've built and we're more than willing to help anybody who wants to build a life similar. We're more than willing to help people figure out how to do that. In addition to that, my life is for showing people what's possible. My life is for inspiring other people. And if they have that jealousy, then they're just stuck where they are and they can stay there. It's okay for me, but it doesn't dictate what I do. I, I will buy fast cars. I will buy really nice watches. I, I will live in a really nice house. Like wealth is not a negative thing in my opinion in any way, shape or form. And I won't let somebody else's thinking because when I probably look at the, what their financial position compared to mine, I'm not going to let them dictate to me how I live. Like, I, I'm not going to dim the light. And I've been there before where it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I shouldn't buy this because somebody else might not be able to do it and they might feel bad. But I, that's just utter nonsense now for me. I agree on that. And I'm going to add to it the way I, uh, I relate to people or I talk about that in so many places on my podcast too. You know, uh, you are the lead character or the lead uh, actor in your own movie called Life. So everybody around you, everybody, that's just a supporting cast. Why you wanted to pay attention to the supporting cast? You wanted to use the supporting cast in a way to excel in your life. Yeah. So that's my two cents. And that's the motto I live by. I don't care because my competition is only with me, not with anybody around me. And I'm not competing with them. Like, this isn't because I'm not doing this to impress you. Like, none of the pictures from my trip are on social media. Like, this is solely because I wanted the people that I was with to have that experience. Mm -hmm. Now, they may people, go talk about it. But know? when people you see are struggling to even pay the rent, and, you know, I like just kind of live day to day. And I think much of that is 
a matter of decisions that were made and they might not have been made right in that moment. And the person who's being impacted by that may not be the reason why maybe somebody else before them made a decision and then they ended up in a situation. And that's unfortunate, but that's not my problem. And then we live in America. Like if you're willing to make the right proper sacrifices, I, I used to, I worked with a lady and I, I'm late for a meeting, so I got to run, but I worked with a lady who made $13,000 a year before in the next year, she made 800,000. She put a hundred thousand dollars on credit cards to get education. So she had the knowledge that she needed in order to do the deals that she did the following year. She made 800 grand and she had $13,000 a year before. Like we get to choose. We get to choose and it doesn't happen instantly, but we get to choose. And it's that choice where we can either fight for our limitations or fight for the life that we want. And so for me, I, we get to choose, like, I'm the son of a soldier and stay at home mom. Like I made more than my dad when I graduated from college. Being an accredited investor isn't what he taught me how to do. Like he won't even invest in the stock market because he got hurt with the dot-com bus. Right. So like we get to choose, we get to make the difference. We get to decide. And if you're willing to learn from people who have done it, then I think the sky's the limit as long as you're willing to do the work. Vicky, I got to run. Thank you so yeah, much for having me. Me too. Yeah, thank you so much, Rome. It was such an insightful session. Would you please quickly share your contact information one more time? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of people... Maybe yeah, I put everything in the chat, you. but um, let's just connect on LinkedIn for anybody who's got questions. You can message me there. That's the link for me. Awesome. And thanks Talk again, to everybody Rome. Soon. And thanks, everybody. No networking today. We'll see you in two weeks again. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks, Vicky.